to another edition of Copy and Open Source, a place to meet some new friends, have some great conversations, and maybe learn something along the way. I'm your host, Isaac Levin. And if you're enjoying the interviews here, be sure to like, subscribe, follow wherever you're watching or listening. Also, if you're interested or know any folks that would be interested in coming on chatting, feel free to reach me on Twitter. My handle there is IsaacR11. All right, so with that out of the way, Copy's ready. I'm excited for my guest. My guest, we're going to have a great conversation. We were talking a little bit earlier about some of the things we share passion-wise, and I'm excited. My guest is Liz Fong Jones. Liz, do you want to say hello? Introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Liz. I'm the field CTO at Honeycomb.io, and I've been uh, working in the kind of SRE DevOps uh, cloud computing space for the past fifteen years or so. Yeah, I, I, we so just as a little bit of sneak, we were going to talk about all sorts of great things around telemetry and open source and tech in general, and I'm really ex looking forward to it. I like to start the conversations with, you know, what is your tech origin story? Like, do you remember the time when you came across technology and you realized that this is what I want to be associated with? This is what I enjoy doing? Runs in my biological family. Uh, I'm very fortunate that way. So on my biological mother's side, um, her siblings, uh, a majority of them, all in fact for my, <laughs> all in fact for my, for my, my biological mother uh, were kind of uh, tech, tech folks, programmers, entrepreneurs. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, one of those first moments uh, that was particularly fun was um, getting like shown a silicon graphics workstation, um, you know, way back in the 90s, right? And and being shown the internet, and it was like, 
whoa, holy, sh holy oh, oh my goodness. Yeah. Like, you know, this is, this. You, you can visit the White House website and the correct White House website that, the, you know, my, uh, my, my uncle had to, had to make sure that I typed out gov. Uh, but yes. That's, that's awesome. I mean, it, it is something interesting to say. It's like when you have family that has a, a, a particular background that we tend to, you know, do one of two things. We gravitate towards that and we kind of just follow right on the coattails or we do like the exact opposite of what that family does. Like, uh, it's, so that's really, really exciting. So when, I mean, obviously as you've gone through your professional career, there are certain things that I think that you've probably, um, been more interested in, maybe interested isn't the right word, things that you've, you found you've had more passion for, like, when did you realize that, you know, the stuff that you're working on right now, like in the observability space, when, why, when did you figure out that was interesting to you? So this is an example I love to use when talking about the difference between mentoring and sponsoring. Um, because I never would have come to kind of working on force multiplying like teams of engineers. Um, if not for a opportunity that I was given in, I think, 2017 or 2018 to co-chair SRECon. A uh, director at Google in site reliability engineering was rotating off of the uh, chair chairing the program committee. And she asked me, hey, like, you know, Liz, you never like, you know, chaired a committee before, like you've spoken at a con few internal conferences, but you've never spoken in, at an external conference. But like, you've worked on all of these teams at Google, like relating to SRE. Um, would you like to co-chair SRECon? And I said, sure, I, I've never done this before, but this sounds exciting, right? Like that's kind of the very definition, the very definition of sponsorship where someone like, you know, sees the potential in you to do something and says, okay, like, you know, like, I'm going to take you out of your comfort zone. Like here, here's an opportunity you would, would have never thought to do. Um, and that's when I really learned that I wanted much more than to kind of, you know, build my own fiefdom and to kind of, you know, manage a group of, you know, even like 20 engineers, 50 engineers or something like that, right? Like that instead I was going to have the most impact in my career if I helped up level the entire industry, if I helped teach people best practices and how to manage their systems. Um, so that's kind of where my journey into observability started was because I realized that a lot of the things that we had struggled through at Google and like, you know, some of my teams were more advanced than others. Those were lessons that could be applied across the whole industry. And therefore that I wanted to kind of work at a company that was, you know, helping every SRE team get better, not necessarily just, you know, managing an individual SRE team. Yeah, I think there's something to say too about, you know, and I think you probably would agree with this, like telemetry and observability, they're kind of an afterthought in a lot of activities that we do, right? Like if you're building an app, the last thing you probably care about is a few things. You, you care about logging last, you care about telemetry last until things hit the fan, right? Exactly, right? And same thing with like on the op side, right? Like we only really care about how how are, you know, the fleet of instances of servers or whatever you want to call it, how they're running until things start to go haywire. And I, I, I my question for you, which I've tried, I've asked a, a million people this question, not really, but why is that? Why are these things that are so critical to saving us in the future? Why do we not focus on them in the present? I think it's two reasons. I think number one, people tend to um, have this hindsight bias of if only we'd done the thing after after it's already broken, right? So as long as you move fast, people don't necessarily care how much you break things. I, I think that's kind of one bias that we're trying to correct for in the industry. I think the other aspect has to do with um, who's doing this, right? Like um, how do we how do we make sure that all of the incentives are aligned so that people don't move on from projects, um, you know, before before they see the production ramifications? How do we make sure that people are on call for the services that they operate? I think that those are important things for making sure that we have people thinking about operability from from day one rather than kind of adding it in as an afterthought. But I do think that there is a paved road there in that we mostly agree today that writing comments is good, right? That you sure. don't check in code without comments. We mostly agree, okay, although, although to a lesser, lesser extent, there are definitely some companies that do not do unit tests and those companies product quality suffers, right? But we mostly agree that software quality and testing should be a developer responsibility. 
So that kind of begs the question, why is instrumentation, why is observability, why is telemetry not a developer concern? And the answer is it, it has to be. Uh, it, yeah. it has to be. And the way that we get there is by making it easier for people to do, yeah. for easier for people to practice. Yeah, and I think that kind of leads into something that I think we'll we'll talk about in a bit about like is has the problem kind of been that depending on the system, depending on the application, like the way that you instrument, the way that logs are generated, the the structure and the schema of the logs is different. Is that part of it? Is that there's kind of like this tribalness between different approaches? Like, oh, like logging in Windows is different than logging uh, in Unix app environments and logging with IAS is different than Apache or whatever, right? Is it because all these different tools have different quote unquote best ways that you log and, and collect telemetry and having some sort of unified approach is substantially more accessible for folks? It's two aspects. It's both the generation of the instrumentation and the telemetry, as well as the analysis afterwards. Um, yeah. Sure. When you're used to grepping through log files, you, you know, anyone can kind of do that, right? Like, and yeah. there's kind of this, a lot of this, you know, management. But I do kind of this um, issue that if people are not getting value out of the telemetry they're generating, they're not going to they're not going to invest further in it, right? So I think that yeah. we, what we have to do is we have to make sure that people are using common standards and they're able to answer their questions. Um, I, I had a funny conversation with uh, with, with a, a client who said that before they started using uh, before they started using Honeycomb that you know they, they would generate the data and it would, they they'd throw it out the window right like that that wasn't actually that useful so no amount of even even common standards around around telemetry are going to help you unless unless you have have a way to make it useful to your team. Yeah, I mean there is something to that right like and you talked a bit a little bit about open telemetry right like. The idea that, and it's, it's just one of those things, maybe you, you knock yourself on the head, catch 22, hindsight being what it is, right? Like, why was it always like this, right? I, obviously, I think it's-, it's Yeah. Weird. Yeah, I think that the reason why there wasn't necessarily convergence around telemetry standards before was, you know, number one, logs are relatively simple, right? Like, you know, anyone can kind of create logs and almost there are standards around logs, right? Like you write, you emit logs in JSON format, right? Mm -hmm. JSON format is kind of how we do things for make things moderately, you know, machine readable. That doesn't make them perfectly machine readable, but that's at least a start. But the issue was that for tracing, for the tracing signal in particular, there was kind of a lot of magical APM, right? Like this kind of magical automatic instrumentation that people were expecting and that people had previously constructed all of these competitive moats around, you know, if you use my APM solution, you'll get the best analysis, right? Like, sure. and, you know, why would you want to use anyone else's? Why would we want to have a common standard, right? Like, and that worked only up to a point. And that was the point at which, you know, you have vendors that go defunct, you have vendors that, whose product doesn't keep up. And then people suddenly realize they have to rip all of this out and replace it. And then they're like, wait a second, like, we've been burned once, we don't want to ever be burned by this again, right? How do we make sure that you are able to get the, uh, make sure that you own the telemetry as an end user? Oh, I mean, I, I use the example, I have a, one of my best friends, uh, I'm not gonna name the company, but they, they're kind of in charge of observability for a very large tech company. And mm -hmm. their, their exact story was we have a vendor and Mm -hmm. Literally, they're always at this balancing act of, do we replace the vendor? And it's like, well, no, it will be so much money to replace this particular observability vendor that we might as well, they could charge whatever they want and we'll probably still be okay with it, right? Like, I mean, great for the vendor, like great for them. But like, are you bringing value to the business if you're, if you're completely locked in, right? Yep, ding, 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 ding. Right, that's that's kind of how how that goes, right? Yeah, it's it's interesting too. Like you know, especially when we talk about these are things that are it, the goal of them is to make the lives of our future selves better, right? And I've always kind of questioned, you know, in you know when people are learning how to program or like whether it's going through the typical computer science route, going through, you know. Um, code camps or what have you like when why do we have this situation where a lot of this sort of stuff is on the job sort of training 
Is it because of, you know, it depends on what, where you work and what systems you use? Is it dependent on there are more important things to teach in a computer science uh, or a, a, a code boot camp practicum? Like, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Like, why aren't we talking about telemetry to people getting started in the in the field, right? We absolutely should be, but the reason is that, you know, we make fun of grad student code, we make fun of kind of throwaway projects is because you don't live with them long enough to, to live yeah. with the consequences. This is why some of the favorite um, courses that I that I had at MIT were the ones where you had a semester long group project, right, like where you had to embrace source control, embrace testing. If you did not do those things, you were going to be paying down your technical debt, you know, a month, two months later. Um, I, if you are turning an assignment and you know you, you get it hacked together the night before and you turn it in and you never see the code again, right? Like that's not going to teach you those practices. Whereas something that keeps you working with multiple people with kind of shared cognitive state over multiple months, that will incentivize you to to start learning those practices. Um, so this is actually um, you know we love you, you. You're saying that you wanted to talk about like career stuff, right? Like one of the funny things for me is that. I am someone who interrupted her college, right? Like I, I dropped out of college two years in, went to work for Google for a couple of years, um, went back to school. Sure. And that made me both a better developer as well as a better student um, mm -hmm. to kind of have that experience of going back and forth yeah. because I took that experience from being a practicing software developer into my college courses and, you know, told, sat my groups down for group projects and was like, you know, we are going to use source control. We are going to use issues. We are going to use pull requests. Like you're not just going to land things, right? Like, you know, you're going to write the tests and you're going to make sure they pass before you merge, right? Yeah. It is pretty interesting. You, you, you said something that it makes a lot of sense as to like, you know, you always hear about, you know, and, I, and I've had the luxury of, of going to, when I was going to university, like there were some people that were, I guess, mid-career people that decided to go back and reinvest in their education. And the anecdotes they have are real world, and that's great. And I wonder if there's some capabilities, maybe some universities are doing it, like instead of doing your, you know, your internship, your what have you, like a month before you graduate, maybe you do it halfway through the program. So you have some form That's the system like, in Canada. Um, yeah. the, Can the Canadian uh, college system uh, encourages people to do uh, externships, uh, which are really, really fantastic for teaching there. I wish more uh, countries yeah. around the world did that. Yeah, it's, it is, it's kind of interesting because in general, like a lot of the things that we learn in a computer science curriculum or information systems curriculum, it's all so, okay, you're probably going to need this at some point in your life, but you don't know. Like, I, I jokingly say, like, I've never once had to, like, one of the programs I had to do in college was, like, program an ATM. I've never had to program an ATM in my career or do anything similar to programming an ATM in C. Never had to do that. But it, this particular curriculum thought that it was essential that I learned how to do that, which I guess memory management in C and things like that is important. But is it so important for most folks that are coming out of these practicums and getting jobs as developers or architects or what have you hand in hand with that is kind of you know when we think about um when we think it's actually not very strongly correlated. The better correlations are with um, some of the best essays I've worked with in my career have been physics majors or physics PhD or, you know, sure. physics, physics grad students, because they have the experience of kind of, you know, by hook or by crook, making, making these kind of complex distributed systems and models work. So kind of yeah. rewarding practical experience is something that I think that we need to get much better at as an industry, um, rather than saying, you know, does this person have the right pedigree? Yeah, I think too, like, and I, a lot of companies are doing this more and more, which I think is great, which is the idea of like rotating people through different, I guess, job, job functions. Yeah. Right. Like you'll have somebody on a product group go work in, in the, in, in SRE or vice versa, or you'll have people from the field go get it embedded into a product group or whatever. Right. Because I think that the underlying goal, like, like I jokingly tell this, like we're all trying to make money, the company money. We just have a different tool to do the thing. Right. Um, and having an understanding of how different people in different areas of the business work is really, really essential. Um, I know that, like scale is challenging, like figuring out how you're going to do all that interconnected tissue. Um, 
but I think in general, it just makes things more efficient. Plus you also build that empathy. Like we talk about empathy a lot when I, when on this show, like you have to understand that not everybody does things the same way that you do and building that empathy is really, really important. Right. Like, and one of the things I'd love to hear from you, like you've gone through and you've done like, you've done a handful of, you've had a, a handful of different, I guess, core functions of the job right mm-hmm. like you've been in sre you've been in developer advocacy and you know recently you you moved over to a different kind of role like do you want to talk about like you mentioned what your role was a bit earlier but you want to talk a lot, little bit more of how different it is to what you thought it was and maybe some assumptions that you made i'd love to hear some of that yeah i think that the progression is a little bit you know sideways right like it's not necessarily always up up and to the right um so i started def- my career definitely as a individual contributor site reliability engineer or you know the predecessor to that right like slinging around you know unix unix uh unix shell commands and stuff right like i was a systems engineer and then i was an sre um but as i as i said earlier right like that kind of opportunity to teach people with SRECon that kind of really um, showed me that that was kind of a career path that I wanted to pursue. So I started working with Google Cloud's customers um, when I was working at Google Cloud. Um, So I was part of the customer reliability engineering team. And then I switched over to becoming a developer advocate, um, kind of recognizing that a majority of what I was doing was kind of educating and kind of creating material uh, rather than necessarily pairing with customers to kind of create a great experience for them. And when it came time for me to move on from Google, it was kind of this um, this thing where I was looking at, you know, where can I have the most impact? Where can I force multiply uh, what I'm what I'm doing? And, you know, I basically the number one challenge I was looking at was I recognized that people were having challenges debugging their systems, that if I could help people better debug their systems, that would be the best way for me to have a positive impact on the industry and up level of people. Um, but it definitely, you know, sure, the job title is DevRel at, at the end of my time at Google, the job title is DevRel at the, at the beginning of my time with Honeycomb, and yeah, it... <laughs> It it turns it turns out that DevRel at a big company and DevRel at a small company are wildly different. Um, sure, I'm sure, sure you've experienced this too, right? Like with with change, with changing jobs between big companies, small companies. Right? Like it, it turns out that there's a lot of infrastructure and scaffolding at large companies, and you know even different scaffolding between different big companies. Um, so, you know, with uh, with Google was fascinating, right? Like, you know, you would, you would talk to customers, you would, you know, collect their feedback, you would, you would kind of give, give talks and kind of show people, show people how to do things. And if you wanted to get change made in the product, like that, that was going to be a month long process, right? Like there kind of was not necessarily this expectation of, you know, oh, I can just fix this, right? Like, and what I found was really cool about when I joined Honeycomb was we were 25 employees, right? Like I could literally, you know, watch a customer experience a friction point and then i i could just go in and fix fix the fix the bug that that same afternoon and be like you know hey hey customer i fixed it like you know when uh one of the stories i like to tell there is it it turns out that for a while if you were working inside of the honeycomb query builder and you switched tab focus right like because you were looking up some documentation or you're cut pasting something from somewhere else it would actually lose the current item that you are working on so literally the first oh. fix that I committed into Honeycomb's code base was fixing that bug, right? Like was, was, Hey, yeah. like, you know, we shouldn't be losing user input when, when someone put, fo- refocuses yeah. the tab. Right. So kind of that freedom to just fix, fix bugs as, as you encounter them. Like that was, that was really cool to, to be able to do. And yeah. And now, and now you can tack in like UI expert. Into your resume <laughs> God, no, too, right? no, 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 no. <laughs> right. Like I, I, the best thing that I can analogize being a being a DevRel to is kind of it's like being the uh, Dungeons and Dragons class factotum, right? Like you have a little bit of sure. everything, right? Like you have the ability to spend your you know expertise points on anything you like. It's yeah. less efficient than having a specialist in each of these things, but the cool thing is being able to kind of generalize and see see all of it at once, um, and kind of be able yeah. to fill in for anything. Um, so yeah, speaking of filling in for things, right? As I grew my career at Honeycomb, one of the things I wound up doing was starting to not just solve friction points for customers or you know give give talks and seminars to customers, but actually to start bringing in cutting edge technology from outside of Honeycomb into Honeycomb. Um, 
Hmm. So things like uh, the AWS Graviton processors, uh, things like open telemetry, those were things that I saw in the marketplace and said, like, we have to get on top of this. Like, this is really exciting. This is something that I think is going to be important for the future of the company. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, and I, I hope that, you know, me designating you as a UI expert immediately wasn't <laughs> terrifying. But I think one of the things that's, you know, I love the... The analogy that I've seen that really works really well for developer advocacy or DevRel in general is like the iceberg effect, right? Like, you know, you see like the little tip sticking out of the water, but underneath is tons and tons of other stuff that isn't visible, right? And I think one of the big things is being that inbound conduit. Like you have conversations with external customers, internal customers, and you report that back to the product group and hopefully you can, you know, you said months long, like that's pretty fast in a lot of companies I've worked at, to be completely honest, right? But like, you know, your your story of being able to just make a change, tr as trivial as it was, but immediately like shows the customer that you care, which is the biggest thing. Like, it's honestly, all, you know, right, like even at larger are, companies, like, it's not necessarily, you know, sure, it might take months to get, get a fix prioritized and get the change made to the product, right? Like, customer doesn't care necessarily about the fix, they care about being able to accomplish their workflow, right? So I am doing a fine job as a developer advocate if I'm showing the customer how to do what they intend to do, even if there is still some bug, right? Like having that knowledge of the customer's problem, the product, and kind of being able to help solve the problem. And I think even going to like a, a, a sociological level, they just want to feel like they're heard as well. Right. Like I think in general, like all of us as human beings want to have like some connection with other human beings, right? To some level. And if you can say, I see the problem that you're having, let me report it back. And then that's just not lip service. Something actually happens. Like that's just, you know, whatever you want to call it, maintaining customer trust or whatever buzzword thing you want to sing. Like that's really, really important because that's how you get word of mouth marketing to grow a business, right? Like, cause you can spend millions of dollars on real marketing, but if you develop mindshare that your company cares or cares isn't the right word, but is listening and iterating on customer feedback successfully, that's very, very, that, that's, that's literally the number one way to make money, right? Yeah, I definitely think so. You know, as long as you get on that initial list of, of companies that people yeah. are willing to consider, right? I think that's kind of been one of the challenges yeah. that Honeycomb has been in for the past four years, right? Like is kind of growing from being this, frankly, niche company, right? Like we didn't have product market fit, right? Like mm -hmm. we were trying to figure out who was the ideal set of customers? How do they adopt us? How do we find them? How do we reach them, right? Like we have this passionate community but figuring out kind of how to leverage that into, okay, how do we reach people who have money to spend, who have, you know, larger scale yep. problems to solve, right? Like that's, that's kind of been our journey for the past four years. Yeah. And it ties back into the conversation we were a bit earlier, where it's not like the, the problem that Honeycomb is trying to solve isn't a problem that a lot of customers immediately think of as a problem they need to solve right from the get go. Right. But then, you know, that's, it depends on how you phrase things, it, right? Like that, that's yeah. the thing, right? Like, yeah. you know, if you, if you ask people, you know, hey, would you would you like less downtime? Would you like to spend more of your time actually, you know, developing features and not doing break fix? People say, yes, can I have a unicorn too, right? Like, but it's yeah, really, yeah. Oh, here's the problem, right? Like when you lead with saying, you know, we are a distributed tracing solution, right? Like that, that, that doesn't give people the warm fuzzies, right? It doesn't tell you what problem you're solving. It just tells them how you're solving it, but you haven't articulated the value. Yeah, yes. Yeah, and that's enough. Like that's a challenge in general. Like as you try to balance that very very thin line of marketing, but not marketing, talking too technical, but not technical enough. Like it, it it's especially like if you go to like, and I'll, I use this analogy a lot. Like if you go to a booth, and a booth at a technical event, and the who's ever working at the booth, like they have a particular skill set. Sometimes they're developer advocates, sometimes they're sales engineers, sometimes they're people in the product group, whatever, 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 right? More than likely, they're not going to be able to answer the direct question that you might have. But the number one thing that they have the capability of doing is get you plugged into the system, right? And something as simple as like being able to do a demo and, oh, I have a question about that, this thing that you're doing here. Okay, well, let me get your contact info. And that turns into something tactical. Right. We are almost human request routers, right? Like that kind of knowledge yeah. and mapping of who do I talk to, kind of how do we how do we best solve this as a team, right? Like as you're saying, right, in terms of being the tip of the iceberg, right? Like if you're that 
focal point for the organization, it means that people know that they can, you know, you may not be able to individually find the problem, but you'll be able to, as a team, uh, figure out how to, how we're going to solve this. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's quite captivating, like this whole idea of like, all you're really trying to do is just bring the, the skills and the value that you have and connect two dots. And I think one thing that's really, really interesting, especially in that vein, is like this idea of coming back to what we were talking about with mentorship, right? Like, I imagine that folks reach out to you occasionally and they'll say, hey, Liz, can you give me like a couple of pieces of advice on how to get started in tech or how to get started as an SRE? Or can you get me a job at Google? Like, you know, all the questions that you probably get requests for. Mm. Right? Like, do you, like, how do you kind of, how do you give that level of feedback to, you know, these, it's not as simple as just doing this, 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 and this. Yeah, I think there are so many resources now available with regard to SRE in terms of reading lists, right? I can point people to the Google book about SRE. I can point people to the SRE workbook, Seeking SRE, right? Like there's, there's kind of all of these books now available to people to read. But that's not necessarily a substitute for kind of practical expertise with, with actual real living systems, both uh, social and technical. Um, so I think that people do need to understand that you have to gain experience, you know, whether it be through your work or whether it be through a home lab, right? Like with, with seeing how things fail at the pointy end of the stick. Um, I think the other part of this though, is how to build the right networks, right? Like how to build the right uh, frameworks in your head for like, how do I look at this? How do I kind of decompose problems? How do I think about things curiously? Um, I can teach you the tech, right? That's not a problem. Yeah. And the thing that I cannot yeah. teach is kind of the curiosity, right? Like if you see, see something failing, right? Like, you know, and, and you're like, oh, you know, maybe that was just, you know, maybe that was just a fluke. That's never going to happen again. Right. Like that's not necessarily going, going to serve you well if you're looking to become an SRE, right? Like if, if <laughs> there's this uh, hilarious XKCD comic, right. Of, you know, scientists being like, Hey, you know, lightning strikes, strikes a spot and shocks me whenever I push this button. And the scientist goes, I'm going to push the button again. Right. I'm going to figure out why this yeah. is happening. Right. Like, yeah, that's the thing that makes for a great SRE, right? Like that's the thing that I cannot teach you. I cannot teach you curiosity, but if you are curious here, you know, here are all the resources here, here are all the ways to get started. Here's, here's how to learn. Um, and, and the list is always changing, right? Like it, it's, it's not necessarily, you know, this is what really frustrates me when people are like, you know, every SRE needs to learn themselves the Kubernetes. It's like, sure. Kubernetes is what we use to orchestrate workloads today in some places. It's not universally exactly. used and that might not be what we use, you know, five years from now, but what will serve you well is developing that skill of looking at systems to figure out, okay, like, you know, is it A or B in, right? Like, how do you divide up problems? How do you solve them? Right? Like that skill is perennial that, that, that's never going to change, uh, regardless of what the technology you're using is. No, I, I totally agree. I, I bang this drum all the time. Like, you know, I pride myself. I don't know if it's prideful or not. Like I'm not the best developer. I will never be the best developer. I'm not going to be some brilliant person that is, you know, designing languages or creating frameworks that millions and millions of people use. But do you know what I can do? Like you give me a problem and I can solve it fairly quickly. And if I can't solve it myself, I'll exhaust every resource that I have to solve that problem. And that's where the real value of being a technologist comes into, right? Like I can probably get dropped into any job and with a little bit with some ramp time, obviously, depending on my, the skills required, right? I can effectively do that job because I have, like you said, that curiosity, that ability to kind of conceptualize like, okay, I need to compartmentalize different things. I could do this and then this and this. And I think that's one thing as well to go back to what we talk to when people are joining the industry. We don't, do a really good job of effectively saying like, it's a, it's a problem solving job. Like I use the example, like 99% of the time you're going to build some app that interacts with some data source more than likely you're going to create some, uh, I guess the CRUD app. application. And, yep. Yeah. Right. But so all the problem, at least, and this is probably not safe to say in a lot of cases, but like all of the super, super challenging problems they're already been solved or to an extent are being solved in some iterative fashion, right? So the ability for you to come in and bring value to the space 
is by taking your curiosity and your interests and then just going with it. Obviously, and also, right, like being able to understand so much, what's right? out there. How do I compose these pieces, right? Like, you know, sure. Yes. Many of the hard problems have been solved, right? Like the, the, the problem is knowing when to use which solution, right? Like when do we yes. take things out of the toolkit? You know, how do we assemble them together? Yeah. Oh, the analysis paralysis thing is completely and utterly real, right? Oh, you mean to tell me that I have 14 different tools that really do the same thing? Or like, oh, look at all these NPM packages that are literally the same thing, just different opinionated ways on solving the same problem, right? I think it's very, very interesting that there's like another level of, of you know, a really strong technical person that has the ability to filter out that noise. Like, you know, if I'm going to go look at an NPM package or a, 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 a Pi package and I, I look at, like, okay, like how active is this package? Like before I even download it, before I test it out, like how active is it? If I have an issue, is the maintainer going to respond to me at all? Or is the maintainer currently working on some other cool thing they're working on, right? So like some of these things you don't immediately think of, but they're really important because at the end of the day, if I download some package, this NPM package, so now I have to wait for that to ha happen. I have to wait for the build. I have to wait for all that stuff. And then all of a sudden, oh, I'm running into an issue with setup or an issue with something. I am immediately blocked because I have no idea what this code does because I didn't write it. And more than likely, I didn't look through it line by line on GitHub. So like that ability to be able to effectively decide and have some sort of decision-making process to what you want to take on as a dependency is really, really important as well, which we don't talk about at all either. Right. It's this thing of, you know, time boxing. Time boxing is this critical skill for senior engineers, right? Yeah. To know when do you continue working on something versus when do you give up? And honestly, this yeah. is a thing that I try to make sure that I, that I educate junior engineers about, right? Like it's, it is not a personal failing. If you give up on something, you know, after two hours and come to me for help, I would rather you come to me after, you know, even an hour um, so that I can help you out rather than you struggling alone for two days because you're afraid to ask for help, right? Like you have to be able to fail slightly faster um, in, in order to, mm -hmm. to make sure that, you know, maybe the approach wasn't right. Maybe uh, someone else has the knowledge you need, right? Like either way, like, you know, interrupting what you're doing rather than just working harder at it. Yeah, I think too, and this is and this is just a, a blanket state like you are not the norm though like a lot of senior engineers don't want to be approached by the junior engineer to help them with a problem right you see that as bringing value across everything right so how do we do better in technology is it being more empathetic is it just being okay with being interrupted, being a less grumpy in general? Like, what is it? I, I agree with you on the less grumpy thing, right? Like, I, this is one of the things that we talk a lot about in the senior and staff yeah. plus community at Honeycomb, right? Like, is how do we fulfill yeah. our responsibility both for deep technical ownership as well as making sure that that ownership manifests as indirect influence rather than, you know, mm -hmm. this is my system, like, you shall not take it away from me, yeah. right? Like, I, I think when you are not possessive about what you're doing, right? Like when, when engineers can, can audit kind of al almost know, like, you know, what would Liz say about, you know, about this system decision, right? Like I, I'm doing my job, right? Like I, I think that, yeah. so I, I think that when we think about ownership of software systems, we need to write down the right amount, right? Like we need to make sure that they kind of basic information, like, what is this for? How do I start debugging it? Not exhaustively, like, you know, everything that went wrong with the past hundred outages, but like, you know, what are some good entry points for, for debugging this? Um, you know, who should you oscillate to for help? Um, right, I think that, that is a sign of a well-maintained service. Um, as I say in some of my talks, right, like your importance as a senior engineer is not measured by the number of people who are lined up to talk to you outside of your door that you're ignoring because yeah. you're grumpy headphones on, like, you know, leave me alone, I'm coding, right? Like, being a senior engineer, fundamentally, to me at least, it's it's not about the coding, right? Like you know, sure, sometimes I I will I will write some really deep inscrutable code, but that should be rarely. Yeah, yeah, I, I I totally sign on to that, and I think as we get more senior in our lives, senior in our careers, like the hope is is that we step a little bit farther away from writing code all day long, because that means that we have influence, we have the ability to bring in impact to other folk. And I think that's what's really, really important because a lot of folks think that they can just be an engineer until they're 60, which is cool if you want to be an engineer and you just want to slang code eight hours a week, 10 hours a, or eight hours a day, 10 hours a day until you're 60. That's great. But like, where are you, how are you really 
bringing value because I don't know. And this is maybe just not fair to say you bring so most people bring so much more to the table than just writing code. Right. I understand. Right. Like if you write code that is going towards a dead end, congratulations, you're, uh, you're contributing negative value, yeah. right? Like you, you are, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're creating this unmaintainable yeah. mess that's going to need to be thrown away. Right. Like, <laughs> I, I think that kind of knowledge of how do we accomplish our goal and direct our energy towards the toward, towards the correct outcome. That's that's kind of the important thing to do. Yeah, and and it sounds to me like some of the the things that you've been able to accomplish at Honeycomb is, you know, building this level of senior developer empathy and this idea of like we're all in this together to, you know. Hey, you want to stand on my shoulders? That sort of thing, right? Like, was that something that was easy to accomplish because you were bringing on the right people? Is it was there a lot of growing pains in that process? I'm curious to know, like, how because you know, based on what you're saying, it sounds like Honeycomb, to an extent, has figured a lot of it out. I'm not saying that you're completely done in this space, but it, it sounds to like it's a you 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 provide an inclusive area to work in. Yeah, I think that the main challenge that we've had is Honeycomb has, by virtue of what we do, uh, and by virtue of being a full remote team, we skew very, very senior, right, historically. Um, it's been hard, harder for people who are more junior in their careers to start at Honeycomb because of, of not having physical proximity to be able to look over the shoulder of, of more senior engineers. Um, Definitely when Honeycomb was 10 engineers, 15 engineers, we had a hard time onboarding junior engineers. Um, now that there's a better spectrum and spread of engineering talent, uh, and now we're now that we're an engineer organization of over 50 people who are writing code full time, like, yeah, I think it's a lot easier uh, for people to kind of get the support structure that they need, regardless of where they are in their career. But it took us kind of time and effort to yeah. get there um, and kind of being deliberate about how are we going to support this person in their growth, in their career growth? How are we going to, you know, leverage their existing skills, teach them new things? And it's still true, right? Like we do not hire brand new college grads at Honeycomb, right? Like we will hire people through four years experience. Um, we do have, I, I think this past year, we hosted interns uh, through Code 2040 for the first time, uh, which was really exciting. Um, but yeah, so I think it's this kind of evolution of knowing when can you support people who are more junior and when can't you? Um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I totally agree. Like it's it in the remote culture in general, I've worked at fully remote companies. I've worked at companies that said, hey, come hang out in an office all day and be somewhat productive. And I think <laughs> the, 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 the problem with the remote, completely remote company other than the time zone challenge, which is almost impossible, uh, impossible problem to solve, is just that you lose a lot of that ability to just, hey, let me ask you a question. Sure, you can do that in Slack or you can do that in Teams or you can do that in whatever. But like there is something to say like that knock on the knock on the cubicle wall, like that conversation, like some of the greatest ideas ever have been like random conversations that two people have had and have ended up solving a problem that – would have taken hours and hours and hours if those two people didn't have that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, if you are relatively junior, right, like that kind of process of knowing how and when to ask for help of being able to pair on problems. Um, one of the things I think we do really well is we are very, very responsive to code reviews, right? Like you submit mm -hmm. a full request, people know that it's blocking your work if yeah. that pull request does not get reviewed. And also I think the other piece that goes into this, you know, speaking of feedback loops is when we land code in the main branch, that goes out to production pretty much immediately within an hour or two, right? Like, so that means that you're not waiting days or weeks for the impact, but you kind of get to see the results immediately. Um, and also conversely, you know, you are on the hook, right? Like you don't push code at 5 PM and walk out the door. Like, yeah. We'll push code 3 p.m. on Friday, sure, as long as you're willing to stick around for two hours, right? Yeah. Um, but if you're a junior engineer, right, like you want to have your buddy kind of helping yes. handle you through that process. Yeah, and one thing that I would imagine, and this is tongue in cheek, is that I imagine that the telemetry for Honeycomb services are pretty good, right? Like <laughs> I would hope so. I think, and I think that's yep. We yeah. practice, you know, what we what we say about observability from development. Yeah, I, and and that's I mean. It's something to say about if you're a company that has a, a very particular 
set of skills to quote a silly movie. Like if you if if you bring value to customers in one particular way, you need to be adopting those trends internally as well. Like here's a here's a question that I that I would find interesting, right? Like mm-hmm. obviously with Honeycomb in particular, like the idea is deeply tied to this idea of just bringing users that next level of experience. But obviously when you were putting together the team, like you said, when you joined, there's like 25 or so people, I'd imagine that all the engineers that came from companies that solved customer problems in a completely different way. Like how was that um, opportunity, right? Where it's, you had a lot of conflicting thoughts on, Hey, we should be doing it this way. We should be doing it this way. Oh, I, this big company I worked for did it this way and we were pretty successful. Oh, I used to work at that company too. That company didn't do it well either. Like, how did you kind of manage that, you know, to find one singular mission or is it still kind of ongoing that, that uh, opportunity, I guess you could say. I think that we've been particularly helped by a couple of things. Um, we've had a number of people that have worked at the same company before and kind of are used to the way that each other work, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we've actually, funnily enough, onboarded two people from the same startup that uh, that did layoffs at the same time, uh, and they sure. both came to Honeycomb, right? That was really fun, um, right? So kind of having people whose working styles mesh well together is great. Um, having, you know, certainly learning from experiences at other companies is, is great. But one of the really fascinating things is a lot of people who have used Honeycomb want to come work at Honeycomb, right? Which is awesome because it it means that people are, people are used to kind of the Honeycomb way of doing things even before they started the the day that they started Honeycomb, which I think is really cool. Um, I'm interested in seeing how far that, that can go because, you know, certainly I hope that the base of Honeycomb clients grows much faster than the base of Honeycomb employees. That's, that's, you know, by definition, how startups need to work. Um, but on the other hand, those people can go and champion those those practices at, at other companies, even if they're not able to land at Honeycomb. So, yeah, I think kind of this, um, every, you know, everyone to sign, who signs up for the job, right, like knows that they are signing on to help people practice observability, which means that we ourselves practice observability, right? Like, I, I think that that kind of is a useful unifying factor. And, you know, sure, we can quibble out some of the details, right? Like, um, one of our engineering managers um, who had done remote work for a long time, right? Like he was the one who introduced this idea of um, abolishing standups. So sure. we don't have uh, stand, you know, we don't have like you know a five or ten minute standup every day. That's kind of you know very perfunctory, right? Like sure. you get the team around on a call, like you know, a couple times a week, and crucially, anyone who would schedule an ad hoc meeting with that team drops into that meeting. So kind of doing drop in office hours as a, as a, as a practice, um, like that, that was a thing, uh, that was, that was, uh, spurred on by my colleague Ben's, uh, you know, thinking, thinking and experiencing from other companies. That, I mean, that, that idea is great, right? Like I think managing a calendar for a lot of folks is a full-time job, even to the effect that they have people whose yeah. full-time job is to manage their calendar. So like, I, I totally respect the idea of, like our time is very important. If you have a question that the entire team can provide input on, like here, some office hours, come hang out. I would like to kind of transition a little bit. You know, we've talked about mm-hmm. observability and talked about honeycomb. And I think one thing that's really interesting for me is, you know, the different ways that you get the word out, right? And I know that mm. you have like a book that, that just got published, right? Like I would love to, as somebody who has never written a book, but I've had uh, some friends that have, like, what was that experience like for you? Like, was this the first book you've, you've written? Was it uh, a new experience? Was it something like, oh, this is old hat. I've done this a million times. Chapters to books before, right? Like I was a contributor yeah. to uh, the site reliability workbook. I contributed to Seeking S3, right? Like I, you know, so I, but I've never managed the process of writing a book end to end. And actually I honestly, like I did not, I was not the person who, who managed the, the process of, of kind of writing the book end to end. Um, this was a learning experience for myself um, in that it took us three years to start and finish. Um, we, we yeah. you know, with the confidence that every, and, and hubris that every engineer has, we were like, oh, we can get this done in our spare time. It'll take us six months. Sure, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, our, our our editors at O'Reilly were very patient with us, I'll, I'll say. Um, yeah. 
So yeah, I think the nice thing in some ways about the book being delayed and delayed and delayed was that we got to incorporate best practices uh, into the book rather than having the book be, you know, stale the day it was published because the industry sense, right? Not just Honeycomb sense, but the industry sense of what is observability? How do we apply it? Um, that's gone from abstract, you know, here's Honeycomb's vision to a more concrete thing that is practiced regardless of what people's uh, individual vendor is or whether they've built something in-house, right? Like we can kind of all agree on some of these kind of fundamentals of what outcomes should observability drive? What are some of these stories that people can point to um, that we wouldn't honestly have had three years ago? Um, so the book came out in May, um, but it was a long, long, long effort. Um, Charity, my, my boss and I kind of, you know, struggled our way through it. Um, and ultimately, uh, it was our kind of partner partnerships, uh, our head of partnerships now, uh, George, who kind of pushed it over the line and really, really kind of helped us get everything crisp and in the same narrative voice and kind of all flowing together. That's awesome. I think, too, one thing, like, I was going to ask this and you kind of answered it, like, the idea of running a book for me, the most daunting thing is you just mentioned it, right? Like what happens if I publish the book and it comes out and it's already out of date, right? Like, and it sounds to me like there was a lot of, because obviously this space in the last five years has changed completely, right? Like there's still some core tenants that ex have existed for a long time, but you know, the tools are different. The nomenclature is different. The schemas are different for a lot of part. Like, you know, at what point in time, like obviously you said that you kind of the book got delayed a few times like were there particular conversations that you remember where it's like oh shoot like we've written like three chapters and we have to rewrite them like had, did you have any of any I, I think like the that? main one there there were a couple of chapters that gave us uh trouble right like one one of them was the chapter on open telemetry where you know we focused on using go as the example because honeycomb is go shop also go is kind of the kind of more commonly accepted cloud native uh, you know language for cloud native uh Sure. bedrock technology um but yeah open telemetry was evolving over the time we didn't even know when we started writing the book that would include a chapter about open telemetry right we originally thought that we would need to use uh honeycomb's proprietary sdks to illustrate that but it's a better neutral book we kind of yeah. can't do that right like so that was kind of one conundrum that we had that was neatly solved by open telemetry coming along and then maturing as long as we made sure to stick to you know version 1.0 of the spec right so I think that's one thing, but I think the other interesting thing was we developed this kind of, you know, observability maturity model back in 2019. Um, and it was really great to finally have concrete examples of people actually progressing along that maturity model um, to tell in 2021 and 2022, rather than, you know, say, okay, like, you know, we have this theoretical model of how organizations should do it, right? Like, this is what we think should hold true based off of our experiences seeing organizations struggle without observability, but we've never actually, you know, or like in very few cases, have we seen someone like go all the way from novice to fully experienced, really. Sure. But getting those concrete kind of case studies written down, kind of writing down, you know, here's some of the signposts to look for, right? Like that, that kind of was, was really helpful. And I think what, the final thing was, you know, figuring out the scoping around how much we talk about service level objectives and SRE, right? Like the fact that there was this drumbeat of other books coming out, right? That the uh, service level objective book by Alex Hidalgo, right? Like that book came out and, you know, originally we were going to contribute some of our chapters to that book. And then we wound up, um, we wound up ourselves uh, contributing. Uh, can, we wound up putting those, saving those chapters for our own book leveraging the fact that we suspected people would have read the SLO book, right? So we didn't need to explain what is an SLO, right? Yeah. Was there some, like, I'd imagine as you went through the, the process of, of authoring this book, you probably found a lot of uh, things that could have, how, how to best phrase this, things that you immediately like, oh, now that we write it down, like we're probably not doing it the best possible way. Like, what were some of the outcomes that you took from the, writing the book and kind of writing, like you said, writing everything down, which is really interesting sometimes. How much of that did, like, did reinvest it back in the work that you folks are doing at Honeycomb? We definitely to, reinvested a of, lot of that in terms yeah. of how we talk to customers, right? In terms of, you know, how to encourage them to think about instrumentation, how to think about auto instrumentation versus manual instrumentation. Um, also telemetry pipelines in particular. Um, it was really, really great to interview the folks at Slack which are one of our clients, right? And kind of hear how they manage their telemetry volume and then to utilize those learnings to kind of help other very large scale clients uh, kind of refine and, and, and process their, their telemetry and pre-process it even before we see it.
That's awesome. I, I think that, you know, it, I, I'm ex- so there'll be a link to the book in the show notes and I'm going to go ahead and buy it on my preferred. Yeah, you, you don't uh, have to, uh, device. yeah. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's free. It's free download. It, it's free to right? download it's a free, digital so, copy, but yeah. if you want a, a, a dead tree copy, yeah. Um, you know, uh, you'll have to find us at an event or pay for your own dead tree copy. Yeah, but it is definitely, it's available at ebook and there'll be a, a link to that in the show notes. One thing that's interesting too, as a part of this, you know, you know, the book is a part of it as well as like this idea of, of creating just really like content or creating assets that can allow folks in the community to be successful. Right. I know that, you know, community work is an area of, of passion for you. Like, what is it about the community at large around cloud native tech open source? Like, what is it about that community that really um, invigorates you? I think the thing that's really invigorating is basically the fact that everyone is innovating at the forefront now. I, I think that it's kind of really, really democratized this. Um, previously, you know, sure, right? Like people were leaning on, you know, you have to hire someone from Google or from Amazon or from Microsoft who has seen hyperscale before, right? And that's not true anymore, right? Like there are companies that are doing interesting things in cloud native technology that are that are not quite hyperscale, but that there are interesting learnings from for organizations of any size, right? I think that kind of knowledge transfer, especially with kind of technologies like Kubernetes, right? Like um, with people understanding, you know, how do we make things scale out economically, reliably, efficiently, um, that you don't have to work at one of these kind of companies that is proprietary and keeps things so, uh, close to the chest anymore. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you know that's that's led to you know for instance I know that you've been uh, you're noted as a community champion from a bunch of different organizations, right? Like, what is it about like getting that little bit of flair that is so exciting, right? Is it the the access? Is it the ability to be treated like a bit more of a a trusted advisor, a trusted source? Like, what is it? Some of the the, the perks of these programs that you're a part of that you really bring value or see value from? I think the really great things about community programs like the AWS uh, AWS Heroes program or the AWS Community Builder program is the opportunity to interact with other people who are also excited in kind of educating and exploring the frontiers of what's possible and also being able to provide feedback to product teams, right? Like that the folks at Amazon who are both developer advocates, developer relations, community managers, as well as the service team owners themselves are keenly interested in feedback from people who, you know, sure, yes, it is important that we're under NDA, but it's also, you know, important that we're selected for our ability to give feedback, for our ability to kind of write about in, in a succinct way, like, you know, here's here's the challenges that we're seeing, Here here's some proposed solutions, right? Like, you know, let's, let's co-develop this together so that the experience gets better for everyone. Yeah, I think, you know, as somebody, so I'm a, a Microsoft MVP and I, I happen to work at, at Amazon for, for folks that, that that sort of matters to. The ability to like, you know, like I mentioned, you have conversation with folks out in the community and then you're able, like you said, to bring it right back to the product groups in some form of, it's, it's almost kind of like we were talking about developer advocacy a bit earlier, right? Where it's like there's this tip of the iceberg, and some of the underneath is the inbound stuff, and that, and it's it's very much inbound activity because nobody's going to give you better feedback than the people that want to dog food your stuff, that want to, they want a little bit of that pain because they want to feel like they're providing value, right? Yeah, this so, was the thing where, like, yeah. this was my experience. You know, I, I actually part of what led me to be selected as an AWS community hero was part of my work to adopt Graviton, right? Like when Honeycomb first adopted Graviton in 2019, um, uh, sorry, in 20, in March, in March of 2020, it was bleeding edge stuff, right? Like it was, mm -hmm. there was a lot of brokenness, right? We saw the potential benefits, both in terms of cost and kind of, you know, 30% price performance, 40% price performance, right? Like as well as environmental impact, but kind of it was like, okay, how do we get there? And we are a relatively agile and sophisticated organization, right? Like we can deploy code hourly, right? We can kind of tweak these things. Yeah. How do we get it to a state of maturity such that anyone can adopt it, not just a kind of early adopter organization like ourselves, right? That was kind of one of the fun things that we worked through. And I'm really glad that we did. And now, you know, the experience is a lot smoother such that most people don't have to have that same level of lift. Oh, well, I think it, and it's, the value that it brings to the organization that that I guess exposes this capability to community champions is like no one is like you said 
the opportunity to actually like battle test actual services that, you know, let's be real. Like we're, we've all had jobs in engineering. Like if it works on my machine or if it works in our environment, like let's just ship it. Right. Like that's kind of a, a nomenclature that's been around forever, but until customers actually put that around, you really don't know. Right. So I think that's really, really important. I think that's, if we can empower the community to help us with that next step, it's really, really exciting. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. I, and I think, you know, as we're, you know, wrapping up towards the end of, end of the show and Liz, I want to thank you so much for hopping on and chatting with me. This has been awesome. I love talking about telemetry and I love talking about observability and kind of how different people go about solving some of the problems that we're always enamored with as developers and, and technologists in general. Um, I do have one last question for you. And I know I, I told you at the beginning, I only have one question is the question at the beginning, but I lied. I have two questions, one at the beginning, one at the end. Um, and that question is, if you could kind of summarize in your, in the best way you can, how your thought, what you feel about open source, the, the tech community at large, and you only had one word to describe that feeling that you had, what would that word be for you? Sharing. It's all about sharing. 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 That's awesome. I, I totally agree. And I think, you know, as we're wrapping up, I'd love for you to, you know, if you have any parting words or things that you'd like to add towards the end, I'd love to hear them now. Um, I think the main thing for this particular audience is we're always accepting contributions to open telemetry. Um, so, you know, there are loads of ways to get started, whether it be writing documentation, whether it be writing an integration, like um, open telemetry is kind of ingest and, and ingest telemetry to kind of to understand what's happening with your application. Um, so the better we can make it for everyone, uh, the more observable the world will all have and with fewer bugs. Yeah, and, and just another plug on top of that, that does not mean writing code. You can write unit tests, you can write docs, you can write, you can create content, video content or blogs, like contribute in any way that you feel comfortable. It's not just about slang and code because some of us don't have those skills. So I think that's really important to call out too. Open source is all about whatever you want to bring to the, to the, to the party and you can uh, have as much fun as you want. And, you know, with that, you know, Liz, I want to thank you again so much for hopping on and chatting with us. This has been a pleasure. And for everybody tuning in, thank you so much. And we'll see you next time. Yeah, thanks for having me. Open source. Take care.